Bonjour. I'm Richard Dean Anderson, and I've been in the company of a wonderful crew from Legend, uh, which you're watching right now. Bienvenue tout le monde, on fait un nouveau format qui s'appelle Légende 2000, on reçoit et on va à la rencontre des gens qui ont marqué les années 90, 2000, etc. Et on a fait une demande exceptionnelle pour avoir Richard Dean Anderson, c'est le gars qui jouait MacGyver ou Jack O'Neill dans Stargate SG1, je sais pas si vous vous rappelez de la série. Euh, c'est deux grosses séries qui ont marqué vraiment les années 90 et 2000. Euh, alors pour vous expliquer juste en deux secondes MacGyver, qu'est-ce que c'est C'était un, un ancien militaire en fait qui est embauché comme agent secret par, par une agence et qui à chaque fois elle, elle se retrouve dans, dans la galère et arrive à se démerder avec un couteau suisse. Il n'a jamais utilisé d'arme à feu pendant les 7 saisons, donc c'est ça qui fait un peu la particularité. Et après, Stargate et G1, c'était aussi une énorme série. Et donc, on lui a posé plein de questions à Richard Dean Anderson. Ça fait longtemps qu'on ne l'a pas vu à l'image. Ça nous a vraiment fait plaisir qu'il ait accepté l'interview. Et dans Stargate, en fait, Richard Dean Anderson joue le rôle de Jack O'Neill, qui est un ancien des forces spéciales. Sauf que lui, en fait, il n'a jamais voulu faire son service militaire. Il n'a pas voulu partir au Vietnam. Et euh, il nous raconte un peu son dégoût pour les armes et, et, et comment il l'a vécu, en fait. I never served uh, in real life in the military. I guess I missed out on it. Not that I was fighting real hard to get into the fray, because it was indeed Vietnam time, and a couple of my friends weren't coming back, so I didn't want to go into the Army at that time. I didn't want to serve my country in that, that form, that fashion. I wasn't, uh, and still am not, a big fan of killing people. Um, I, it's just a thing with me. And in doing publicity or interviews during MacGyver was, I'd get asked that question um, every time, what my stance was on, on guns. And I said, well, no. hate them, just hate them. Et en fait, sa manière de, de, de jouer, le, le colonel O'Neill a tellement convaincu l'armée américaine, l'US Air Force, qu'ils l'ont carrément récompensé. Il est devenu général honoraire de l'US Air Force. Well, in, in shooting and making Stargate, we established a, uh, a good working relation, relationship with the Air Force. Uh, general George Jumper was his name. He came out and watched some production, uh, the shooting of Stargate. The first time I saw him, I felt like I had to apologize for the behavior that Jack O'Neill was um, wearing in the early going. So I asked the general, I said, um, are, are you okay with the way uh, the character is behaving and acting? And he stopped me mid-sentence and he said, Yes, we're happy, and don't change a thing. I said, you're nailing it. The story continues a year later, I guess. The word just came down from um, General Jumper that uh, they wanted to bestow me with uh, an honorary um, generalship, if that's what it's called. I jumped at the, at the opportunity. Et on lui a demandé pourquoi il avait arrêté sa carrière d'acteur en fait juste après Stargate et il nous a expliqué. Initially, what initiated my movement was the birth of my daughter Wiley, the best thing that ever happened to me and my life. I mean, so much had happened to me in the the years of my life, adventure and experiences and travel and relationships and on and on and on. That when Uh, Wiley was born, I had to really uh, get serious, uh, whereas I had prior hadn't been too serious about life in, in general, which was evident by my behavior back then. I'll speak in cliches while I'm explaining things or answering certain things, um, but having a child for me uh, made me a man, literally alter the course of my life. And she's 24 now, so there's been some time to, to learn and, and alter the rhythms of, of thought and about um, raising a kid. She's, she's a woman now, and um, I kind of miss the baby part of it. Ah, oh, come on, guys, admit it. You wish they were young again. I can't say that it was time to retire because I, I don't think I was necessarily done. Again, when, I, when Wiley came along, I had something far more interesting to do. Raising a kid is much of a hardship as it can be. 
Uh, it's just a ball. I mean, you, you can't top it with anything. Um, well, I can't anyway. Not yet. Et depuis quelques années, on voit plein de remakes des séries des années 80, 90, même 2000. Et en 2016, il y a eu un remake de MacGyver, donc une nouvelle version de la série. Et Richard Dean Anderson, l'acteur principal de la première série de MacGyver, n'a pas vraiment aimé. Well, personally, I'll speak personally to my situation. I think I'm, it's, it's fine. I mean, I understand business is business. Um, and I can't stand in judgment of someone wanting to make a living you know, giving you that cold answer. Um, I don't, I, I didn't like what they did with the, the second MacGyver. You know, bless them for trying and keeping the, uh, I guess, the legacy alive. But I think as far as a, um, the concept goes, I think they missed the boat. Um, it didn't seem to me to be true to what had been created. I'm sure they're all wonderful people, very, you know, and creative and nice. But uh, as far as the, the franchise, I think they may have done it a slight disservice. Not that it wasn't entertaining. They had to have had a great budget. I wish I had had half of that, what they had. And it shows the difference between, I mean, it, <laughs> Look at the difference between a 1980s uh, MacGyver versus a 2000, uh, whatever, 16? Ah, great year for the States. You'll know what I'm talking about. It, um, occasionally I'll get a glimpse of, uh, of an old MacGyver and boy, it's, it's old MacGyver, I'll tell you. It's just, it reeks of the 80s. Um, production-wise and, you know, maybe even tone-wise, it was, I think, a gentler time. Yeah, I could be wrong on that, but uh, we certainly softened it up a bit. Richard Dean Anderson adore les animaux et particulièrement son petit chien Poppy qu'il a retrouvé mort un jour, mangé par un coyote. Et il nous raconte que c'est la dernière fois qu'il a pleuré. I've had three Australian shepherds and each one of them has is, is gotten deeper, closer uh, to me. Uh, there was Whiskey, my first Aussie, and then uh, Zoe, and, uh, and then Andy. Uh, they could all be on the same team, but Andy was my, my girl. Anyway, she had a, uh, my, when my mom died, she had just gotten a Havanese. I don't know if you're familiar with breeds, but Havanese is a little dog. Was a barker, um, not a behavior. Poppy was her name. My mom died and bestowed. So, um, welcome to the family. You know, I was on the computer in my kitchen, Andy, was on, I have a big couch on just outside the, the back door. My brother came down about 40 minutes later and said, have you seen Poppy? And I said, no, she was snuggling with uh, Andy a minute, a few minutes ago. Anyway, long story short, she, we went out searching and what we found were, were entrails. Coyotes had gotten her and taken her off into the woods and, um, started eating her. The shock of that, I mean, mind you, it wasn't my dog. I mean, we were tight, but you know, the, the depth of emotion uh, wasn't very deep. So poor Poppy got dragged off in there and, and torn apart and shredded and her, you know, all we saw were uh, some of the entrails. I like instantly burst into like th those heaving tears that you get when you can't control. Was the kind I went through when Andy passed, but uh, but when Poppy got nailed by you know this force of nature, this need to eat, it took me a while to intellectualize it to a point where I could be objective and realize that life goes on and all that BS that helps you rationalize uh, mourning and. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll just ramble on if you don't stop me. <laughs>
Alors Richard Dean Anderson, il est à la retraite aujourd'hui. Il nous a raconté une fois où il est passé près de la mort chez lui en voulant sauver son chien de la noyade. Mom had, had died recently and um, so I had this dog, Poppy. She was young enough where she was playful and um, was always playful. So I was in the backyard playing with uh, the rubber ball and I threw it, I was on a slope. I threw it and it bounced down a, a set of stairs of about eight stairs cement stairs that went down to the pool area, uh, the flat part of cement pool. But right when I threw it and I saw the trajectory of the ball, I knew it was going in the pool. And Poppy wasn't a big swimmer. So I took it upon my, I mean, it was just pure impulse, jumped into action and started down these, these stairs to get to the pool to either pull her out or keep her from going in the pool. About the second step I took, which was about mid stairway, um, I, I lost a step and I was then uh, airborne um, and missed the rest of the steps and landed head first right there onto this cement, onto this concrete. I, I sustained a, a concussion, broke my arm, And when I hit, it was that moment, I don't know if other people experience these things, I'm sure they do. There are enough people that it should be experienced. But the minute I hit, or even a split second before I hit, I knew I was in trouble. You actually hear the, the word go, words go through your head. This is it, I'm, I don't survive this. My head hitting first, and um, I didn't expect to come out of my head bouncing off the, the ground. Whatever consciousness I, I lost was momentary. When I kind of, I guess, regained awareness, um, I was on my hand and knees and blood just streaming out of my head. I finally got enough consciousness to realize that Poppy was fine. She had naturally, instinctually um, flapped her wings and, um, and was swimming to the other side of the, the pool where my brother picked. Anyway, I, there was so much that uh, changed after that, um, not the least of which is my memory. Um, I realized that some things, as probably evident in this interview, Things started to become just a little out of reach. Um, well, like an old person experiences, and that became the second element of my um, transition and retirement, which is, you know, things are starting to fail. Et là, on a fini par lui demander s'il se considérait comme une légende, puisqu'on reçoit des, des, des légendes des années 90-2000, dans Légende 2000. Euh, une question qui l'a assez embarrassé, un peu, un peu embêté. Oh, come on, that's so unfair. That's an uh, un, unanswerable question. First of all, you have to assume that I think I'm a legend. Well, I mean, there's some obvious notions to, to appease you. Um, if you're around long enough and people view you in a positive life or positive light, um, chances are something's gonna stick. Either it's your personality, um, your, uh, your output of uh, your charity work, your, uh, your kids, you know, your, your pets, your dogs. <laughs> um, I, I think that all kind of adds to it and it's up to the viewer or the person, you know, to whom you've become a legend. Um, to decide, I think. I, I don't know, again, I'll go back to my original reaction. It's, it's so unfair. It's just not fair. I don't know, if your kids say something like, God, you're cool, Dad, that for me is it. That makes it, that's legendary.
Voilà les gars, j'espère que vous avez kiffé. C'était une première interview. On n'avait pas de traducteur ce jour-là. Euh, c'est pour ça qu'il n'y a pas de traduction d'instantanée, que je ne suis pas assis en face de lui comme d'habitude. Euh, pour les prochaines, on va le faire. On va aller à la rencontre de stars des années 90-2000. Là, on a déjà prévu d'en tourner quelques-unes. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous donner des idées de stars des années 90-2000 en commentaire que vous aimeriez qu'on fasse Allez-y, vraiment bombardez-moi parce que vraiment je vais lire les messages, ça va nous inspirer pour savoir qui on pourrait inviter. Donc mettez-moi en commentaire tout ça. Merci de vous abonner de plus en plus nombreux et merci d'être là avec nous sur Les Gens de Légas.